Kia ora. I think I would like you all to stand up. You've been sitting for a long time. Please stand up and have a shake and uh, just stretch up. And just move those shoulders and just go. Okay, good. You've had sleep, you've had breathing, and now it's about action. Thank you. Anyone still sleeping? Okay. First of all, I'd like to say a very special thank you to the audience for staying on. It's when you've got the all blacks out there and you're in here, I'm thinking, wow. I congratulate you and I think you deserve a big clap for staying on. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to thank the Asthma Foundation of New, of, of New Zealand for the most amazing uh, report that I've actually come across over the years, the breath of life. It has been something that actually relates to actions. And today my role is to actually show you some of the actions that we can be doing. In that report, I looked at, and I've been talking to Tristram and uh, Bernadette about it or so, the things that highlight for me are the area of prevention. We've heard a lot about disease and treatment and things, but we need to also look at being able to prevent. And if you're going to look at equity, prevention is key to what we should be doing. The other area that Tristram actually has pushed, and we are very much in the same line, is health literacy. But where do we look at health literacy? It's really looking at our communities and our families and our young people. And that's where we very, very much believe about young people being the messengers that take these messages into their homes because we don't often reach our patients out in the communities, but we can reach them through schools, and what, that's what I'd like to be able to share. The other area that I thought was really important was the area of training. I think in yesterday's presentations that was very clear. As health professionals, I'm a community physician, so what it means is instead of seeing individual patients, which I used to see, I now look after populations. And when I listen to the community and what they tell me is one of the challenges they have is their doctors listening to them. And I think many of you here have to shared those stories. So what we have to be doing is training our future health professionals to making sure that they actually listen to their patients and not just keep on just using questions or so, but really listening to the patient's stories. So what I'd like to do is share with you a program that we've been working on for several years, for quite a few years, and my passion in the area of peer education. Next slide. Oh, do I change the slides here? Okay. So that's just where, where I'm based, and what I'm talking to you about is peer education to improve outcomes in adolescent asthma and smoking prevention. What I'll, be able, what I'll talk to you about, why adolescents? Why do we think adolescents? Adolescents are, they can be anything from, uh, in the age group I'm going to be talking to you about is 12 to 17 years. But adolescents are 12 to 22 year olds or so. And what, they are our future. They're the future parents, and if we actually work with them, we can actually utilize their energy and their skills to help change the situation. And I hope I'm going to be able to convince you on why that, how we can do that. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of our work that I've been doing for over 20 years. The program, AAA program, which is Adolescent Asthma Action, some evidence. And finally, some of the work we've been doing with our Aboriginal communities in reducing, in uh, closing the gap. And I think, we, I don't know if, how, how many people here have been to Sydney? Majority. How, how many people ha have been to Western Sydney? Okay. One of the things, I've been a, a community physician in Western Sydney, and we have probably one of the largest populations of Maori as well as Islander kids in our schools. And that's been one of some of the groups we've been working with besides some of the most disadvantaged uh, communities. So let's go on to the whole area of adolescence. I started work with adolescents over 20 years ago or more because when we were looking at that as a school medical officer, 
uh, we found that one in seven had a asthma, but one of the commonest problems that they were having at school was they're having regular attacks at school, especially during sporting activities. They used to have to be called, uh, the ambulances had to be called once or twice a day uh, just to manage uh, an asthma emergency. We also know there's high rates of school absenteeism in this, with this issue. The other problem with, uh, um, that we have, and um, they say that ad with adolescent, the adolescent brain, it's actually normal to take risks. And I think as, uh, uh, when you remember your own time, we all took risks as young people. And one of the risk-taking behaviors that's often um, happening is the issue of smoking. But what's, so, what's of concern is that this is the age where they are most likely to take up smoking. So if we can actually change that behavior and not take up smoking, we can actually change their whole life pattern. And our studies are showing that about 17% of our students are smoking despite all the messages that have been going out and despite the rates of smoking decreasing in the rest of Australia in our schools, we've still got high rates of smoking in particular populations. But what's of mo most concern is that over 74% of those students actually have somebody that have, there's a smoker in the home. And I think there's been some issues uh, and many of our speakers have talked about smoking and the prevention of smoking. It's not only just smoking, but so secondhand smoking, but n new data is now coming out about thirdhand smoking. It's about the smoking that is actually in our wall, in the walls and around our beddings and things that actually can affect children, especially children's respiratory health. When you're working with adolescents, this is the very medical sort of model is saying that yes, with adolescents, one of the things uh, when I was working in um, respiratory research many years, and they said, who wants to work with adolescents? They're such a challenge because they don't understand asthma. They often deny they have a chronic condition. They like to be like their peers. Risk taking is common and they often, they don't go to their doctors. That's all very negative. Let's take the positivity, positive actions with our young people. That, that is so, but what do our young people have? They have energy. They have voices, they have strong voices. How many people here have young people in their homes? They actually manage to control their families. <laughs> they, they do, they, I'm sure, they, you have to do what, you, what they tell you. Let's use that kind of energy to help change the environment. This is what we started to do. And I'll start a story. I, as a school medical officer, one of the principals in a school in Auburn, which is one of the most um, multicultural areas in Sydney, he was a principal of a girls' high school. And one of the problems was that there was high rates of smoking in that particular school, uh, school and also high rates of asthma. But the smoking especially happened in the toilets. So every time young people went to their toilets, they ended up having asthma attacks. And as a result, he had to close the toilets. But he was a male principal in a girls only school. And he said, he called me and said, please do something about this because I'm going to get myself into trouble with the parents. They'll tell me, what am I doing closing the toilets? But I either stop, I can't monitor, I can't go into the toilets to see if they're smoking or not. And you could smell the smoking. So the, the, as a result, we decided, I, look, I, I was doing a master's in community health. I was one of the few doctors that decided to work in community health. And the, uh, what I did was we actually ran focus groups with the students themselves. Then we ran focus group with parents. And then we ran focus group with teachers to see what can be done. We looked at the literature and we looked at the theories to see how can we actually influence change in young people. And the two theories that really hit me were the work done by Paolo Freer in the empowerment education. It's not about an expert telling you what to do. It's about group processes and looking at how, what are the issues in their lives and their families? How does it relate to their own personal self and getting our young people to take on the action? And that's what the uh, empowerment education approach is. And also using the social cognitive theory in looking at creating a supportive environment 
Ines was talked about very much about creating supportive environments. That is key to what, if we are going to change behavior. The key message that the young people gave me was, don't make it boring. And that was key. And they also said to me, peer education is the way to go. So what do we mean by peer education? It's about students delivering the educational program to older students to slightly younger students. And why, why do we do that? It's because at this particular age group, they're credible and acceptable source of information. They ensure that they speak the right language. They also provide access to the hard to reach populations. The, the, the people that normally, you know, in a classroom, any teachers here? Normally in the classroom when you're talking, you, know, you get all the, the ones who are interested in the front and the, at the back, especially when you're doing health education, they're normally looking at their phones or so. We want to get at those students who are sitting at the back. And this is what peer education does. And it reinforces learning through ongoing contact. The great thing about peer education is that even those who are doing the teaching, they learn through teaching. It empowers them. It gets them into developing leadership skills as well as reaches large, large numbers. And I think we've just gone through some, and there's a lot of negativity about young people, but if we can actually work with young people, they can be fantastic role models and they can help change that negative peer pressure into a positive peer pressure. And the most important thing that I've learned in working with young people is they're fun. And education needs to be fun. And this is the whole thing. If people are going to learn through fun activities, not just being told what to do. So this is where I'd like to introduce the AAA program, which is the first peer-led asthma program to improve the health and well-being of students with asthma and prevent uptake of smoking in high schools. Can we just have the, uh, what I'm going to do is rather than talking about it, I'm going to show you a short video about the program and then we'll talk more. survive three weeks without food, three days without water, and only three minutes without air? It's something we do thousands of times a day. But for many people across the world, breathing isn't always easy. These people have asthma. The good news is asthma is treatable, and a great way of understanding and managing asthma is through education. And that's where the AAA program kicks in. AAA program stands for Adolescent Asthma Action. Meet Dr. Smita Shah, who started the AAA program at a school in Western Sydney. Hi, Smita. Hi, Sandy. AAA is an effective program where students gain important information from their peers to control their asthma. And they also develop skills to say no to smoking. Jake, you want to smoke? No, thanks. Why not? Because I'm allergic to nicotine. Hey, Emma, want to smoke? No. Why not? Because it can kill me. No, because it could cause addiction. Lauren, want to smoke? No, thanks. Why? Because I have asthma and it'll make it a lot worse. So what is the main aim of AAA? AAA is for everyone. Through peer education, the program aims to improve asthma management. It helps students understand what to do in an emergency. Such as what to do in the event of a student having an asthma attack. Exactly. If you know what to do, you can actually save somebody's life. So tell us, how does the AAA program work in schools? AAA educators train a group of senior students, usually year 11 volunteers, as asthma peer leaders during a one-day workshop held at school. And then the peer leaders take over in step two. That's right. The asthma peer leaders then educate the students in three lessons. And what about step three? Students turn what they have learned into fun performances for the whole community.
hear more about the three steps. So Alina, how are you involved with the AAA program? I was a AAA educator, Sandy. I visited a school and trained students who volunteered to become asthma peer leaders. When I left, they had the skills to educate other students about asthma. What do you use to teach them? We use the AAA kit. It includes a training manual and a peer leaders manual. It also includes two teaching DVDs, Breathe Easy and Running Short. Breathe Easy talks about what asthma is and how to treat it. Running Short is about a young runner who tries to hide his asthma from his running partner and coach. Now let's meet our three asthma peer leaders. Tell me, why do you think some young people don't look after their asthma? I think they get embarrassed. When you're our age, you don't want to seem different. And when you have asthma, it can sometimes seem like that. So how does step two work? The asthma peer leaders with their buddy groups run three lessons. Each lesson takes about 45 minutes each. That's quick. How would you describe a triple A lesson? Well, we try to make it fun and interesting. There's group discussions, games, and an asthma quiz show. Sounds like fun. Well, the aim is to try to get some of our fellow students to have a look into some of the problems that people face in managing their asthma and also to come up with solutions. And at the end, you get them to create their own short asthma performance. Yeah, we get them to be creative and share what they've learned by either making a song, a skit or a play. So it's kind of like a ripple effect. Yeah, exactly. The AAA educators coach the asthma peer leaders, who then educate their younger peers. These students then create a performance that educates the whole school community. Here we go. My name's Andrew E and I'm ready to roll. So you better sit back, cause I'm taking control. So just listen to what I say, this goes on every day. Relax, sit back, or you get an asthma attack. Say yeah, yeah, yeah. say yeah, yeah, yeah. Say asthma. asthma, say asthma. Say we all care. Say we all care. We didn't wrap this for nothing. We wrapped it for our purpose. So in the end, everybody learns about asthma. Let's hear from Peter Keynes, who's been using the AAA program. Hi, Peter. So tell us, does the AAA program work in your school? Yes. Not only does it work, but we are particularly proud of the way it works here. I'm very pleased. We might stop. Uh, the, the full video is actually on the website, but it's just a few more minutes. But I think you got the message about what the program is. It's really, uh, we train university students. We started with medical students, but now we are working with interprofessionals. So that's training our future health professionals. We are using medical, pharmacy, allied health, nursing. We train them at university in a one-day workshop. They then go to the schools, and in five hours, they are training volunteer students from year 10 or 11 as peer leaders. They're not to trained to be educators. What they're doing is facilitators in playing games, activities, and showing the videos. And these students then uh, go into their classes and run three 45-minute lessons. We've been able to show, and I'll show you some data on this, that in less than nine hours, we can actually create a supportive school environment for students with asthma, where they are actually the leaders to say uh, no to smoking. So, as I said, th the first lesson is about more asthma self-management and they learn about uh, triggers and how to manage an asthma emergency. The second is about some of the challenges young people face, especially regarding to smoking or not taking their medication or not going to the doctor. How do they address that? Again, it's through group work and activities. And finally, everything that they learn, they do, they revise through a quiz show, as well as coming up with an action that they can actually, the message they want to give out to their school community community is developed into any kind of action, as you saw. There is a lot of problems about asthma, so, and as this is just a summary of some of the evaluation, but let me go through it a little bit more. One of the things about high schools or primary schools, when we're taking up, we're partnering with schools, it's really important that we actually measure what, that we are making a difference. And one of the things I've learned with working in schools is rather than measuring health outcomes, we should be measuring educational outcomes. If we improve education, we will improve the health of our community. And 
we've done a lot of evaluation and all of this work has been published. So if anyone's interested, please look on our website. We've done formative evaluation to show did the students love it and they love, you know, and we've done 20 years of work on this and they love it. We've also done a randomized controlled trial, which is the evidence to show, does this work? Does it actually improve our quality of life? Does it decrease asthma attacks? And we've been able to show all of that in schools that in Tamworth, which is in the rural community in rural New South Wales. And we published those results in the BMJ. But importantly, the issue of we can have the best program, but I think Many of them remain on the shelves, and I'm sure many of you have been involved in developing programs that... But the issue of dissemination and sustainability, we know that young people listen to more young people, and no matter how passionate I am, they're not going to listen to me. So what we're doing is working with our future health professionals, our university students. They take these messages out. But importantly, by having university students go into these schools, we want our st a a school students to start thinking, I can go to university too. We want them to connect them. We want them to think education in a way so that it's not just about health. They go, in go into education and thereby make a difference in their, their lives as well as their families' lives. Some of the health and education outcomes we've measured both in university students as well as in high school students. And if you can look, they're about leadership, about teaching skills, getting them to be more confident in how they manage. Many of these students, we like to take the students who want to uh, train just to miss school for the day. And what we want is they change in front of you and they want to be able to be involved and they're the leaders in their community. There are a lot of other tangible benefits as we've shown over the years. First of all, it actually really looks at empowering all those ones our university students as well as our peer leaders in taking on leadership role. They also are credible role models and we reach large numbers. Over the years, we've reached over 26,000 uh, students and we've gone to over 40 schools. I think time, just time is um, moving. Wait, uh, I'll just move on to this. Recently, uh, this year has been a very special year in um, with the AAA program, because we've been working in schools in Darwin with our Aboriginal students, with uh, Professor Ann Chang. She's, we're really looking at, do they actually have asthma or not? But first of all, we are educating them to go out into the communities. The uh, Asthma Foundation of Victoria got some funding and are running the AAA program in schools in Melbourne. Our re Tasmania is going to be smoke free by 2020, I think or so, and they've decided they're going to be, and just last month they invited me to train all their um, medical students. And they're going, the medical students are going to schools all around Tasmania to actually take on the AAA program so that they can create a culture where it's cool to be a non-smoker. We're not talking about anything that is wrong, but it's just, we're creating a change in culture. Importantly, this message, um, I had the uh, pleasure of meeting with Tristam and uh, Bernadette and her team, um, Jessica and um, Lauren. Can you please stand up, please, everyone? They actually came to Sydney to see me, to see our students actually working in uh, Western Sydney. And as a result, I was able to train a whole group of them on Monday and Jessica and Laura are actually taking the program to one of the schools in uh, Wellington. Which school? Could you tell? So it's actually going to happen on Monday. And Sydney, we continue the work, especially in schools with our Aboriginal as well as Islander communities. There is a kit that is available, and it's all there, and it's also on the website. We celebrated 20 years of uh, working in our schools, especially with some of our Aboriginal uh, communities. Just very quickly, why are we working in the whole area of Indigenous? This is an area we are not really getting much success, and we need to all be working together. Both asthma and smoking are much, you've already heard in the Maori population, but this is the same as in our Aboriginal population too. We've got much higher rates of asthma, much higher rates of morbidity, and three times higher rates of mortality. What's a big concern is that asthma and smoking are potent combination risk factors, and we've got high rates of smoking in this population. And what we've also learned is the majority of them start smoking, 
at the age of very young age of t uh, 10 to 12. So we need to address that before they ever take that first cigarette. Once you start smoking, it's very difficult to stop. We have uh, several um, activities where they learn how to say no to smoking. They learn how to say no to smoking. They learn how to say no to other people smoking around them. And importantly, they also take a pledge to remain smoke free. This work we've been doing in Jordan, and we've tested this in Jordan, in schools in Jordan, where they have 60% of their students smokers at the age of 15. So they've got a huge problem. And we are getting them to actually take a pledge to uh, remain smoke free. This is some of our data to show do students actually take, with the peer leaders, will they actually take a pledge to remain smoke free? And we found that except for one school, majority of the other schools, they were, take, they were taking the pledge to remain smoke free. And it's peer pressure. Finally, in the thing in our schools that we are working in Mount Druid in Western Sydney, smoking prevention is not enough because many of them are already smokers. So what we are looking at is working with kids, a kid, um, kids Quit with the Children's Hospital in giving counsel, uh, training teachers and our Aboriginal education officers and our Pacific Islander uh, officers to be able to give counseling to students that are smokers and get them to be referred to doctors and uh, pharmacists rather than getting um, suspension and changing, uh, they actually get, uh, uh, sent for counseling. This is just a group of our Aboriginal education officers in the five schools that we are working with who are going to be taking the lead, and this is work that we are doing in the schools. This is just a, this is, I'd like to share with you the picture of Tristan and the whole team coming and working with our students in Mount Druid. That was about a month, six weeks ago? Oh, just only six weeks ago, and they were there in Mount Druid working with our, our students who are our peer leaders who are going to be going to the younger students. The message that I want you to sort of um, take from this is tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I'll remember, but involve me and I will understand. This is the final slide from um, what I'd like to show is this is work done by Noreen Clark, who's passed away. She's from the University of Michigan, and she was one of the leaders in addressing health inequities. And she sort of said, this is a slide that although carefully designed health education pro interventions will not reduce disparities, they can contribute to con uh, closing the health gap while providing benefits for all. But to be able to do that, we need to be putting three times the um, um, uh, efforts. We need to be putting our best people and we need to put up a lot of funding to make sure that we do get that equity. And this is what I see in this group, all of you putting that effort to make sure that we do have equity in health. All of this material is on the website. We are on Facebook, so please like us. And um, just one, I want to show, also tell you that the same model we're using in obesity prevention, and we've got a program called Salsa, Students as Lifestyle Activists. Again, university students teaching other students. I've got handouts, so if you need handouts, I'll leave them in the front, and you can see them. And 30 seconds, I want to show you, just want to end with something that really works. Would I, Otamata, Gabba Gabba Gari, Wongai, Dunano, Janagu. Smoking is bad for you, bad for you. I want to be the healthiest. And if I don't smoke, I'll be the bagliest. My name is Lyra. There ain't nothing clearer. Smoking ain't cool unless you're a fool. My name is Matt. I drive a race car. You gotta be fit, so don't smoke, bra. We don't like smoking and it makes you sick. So it's time to quit, unless you're gonna die quick. Well, I run and have fun. Time to quit. Call me Roy Roy, but my real name's Gordon. I don't smoke, cause I wanna be like Jordan. My name is Molly and I don't smoke. Cause it's bad for your lungs. I don't wanna choke. My name is Xavier. Smoking is a bad behavior. My name is Xavier. Smoking is a bad behavior. Why do you smoke? Are you trying to be cool? 
it just continues on. Again, this uh, video is available on, on the web, and I don't want to take up extra, any extra time. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. You're all probably saying it's her again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yesterday uh, I had the pleasure of, of chatting to Smita and she looked into my eyes and said, Lou, will you sing me a song? <laughs> <laughs> and I happen to have been chosen to actually thank her. So I get the double A. <laughs> so... Um, like I do, I've written the song, and I'm going to do that. <laughs> so I really want you to imagine, and I know you will when you see my prop, that I'm actually one of the adolescents <laughs> that's singing to her. Sorry. Hey, good looking. <laughs> we got you non smoking. We dig your plan to help us teach our own. Hey, good looking. You're a sweet baby. <laughs> Self determination is the key. Cheer, miss. So my, my other role now is to thank her. Um, and I just want to say, Smitha, that thank you for inspiring us uh, to work alongside people who live with respiratory conditions or adolescents who live with respiratory conditions, supporting them to achieve the best quality of life that they determine. Thank you for linking us to Te Haora, the breath of life, our national respiratory strategy. Those links are improving health literacy, supporting health behaviours, and enhancing the role of the education sector in supporting self-management, the seed of self-determination has been sown. We all know of the greatness that happened outside with the parade. Let me tell you that this conference <coughs> has had its very own greatness. The seed has indeed been sown. Thank you.